Hey guys, Miss Hill here, and we are going to continue our lectures on Individual Module 5.2, where we are talking about intrapartum care. Um, this is PowerPoint 2 of Individual Module 5.2, and this is Lecture 1. Here are your learning outcomes that are related to intrapartum care. And we are going to talk first about nursing care during labor and birth of a vaginal delivery. So as you all know, the first step of the nursing process is assessment, no different in labor and delivery. So as the labor and delivery nurse, assessment-wise, what we have to figure out is what is the imminency of this delivery? How quickly is it going to happen? Um, so when your patient comes in and you're doing your initial assessment on that laboring patient, the first thing we want to know is how quickly is this going to happen? Because we want to be prepared. We want to know her prenatal history. We want to know if she has any high risk factors that is going to affect her labor in a negative way. Um, there may be things that we have to prepare for, um, additional interventions that we might have to implement. So, uh, for example, the mom who has hypertension or preeclampsia, we're going to be wanting to do much more frequent reflex checks, deep tendon reflex checks. We're going to be wanting to check her blood pressure a lot more frequently. Um, for the mom who's positive for HIV, we're going to be wanting to start those antiviral drugs. Um, for the mom who's positive for group beta strep, we want to make sure we get her antibiotics started as quickly as possible. So we got to know what high risk factors that we're dealing with in relationship to the mom's prenatal history so that we can um, sort of mold our nursing interventions so that we make sure we have the best outcome for mom and baby. And we also have to do a physical exam, including vital signs. We want to check out her contraction pattern. How often are her contractions coming? What's the frequency? How long are they lasting? What's the duration? And how strong are they? What's the intensity? Along with that, we got to also assess the fetal heart rate pattern. So how does the baby look in relationship to the labor that mom is experiencing? Our bad water broke. So had her membranes ruptured. That R-O-M with a question mark means rupture of membranes. So are her bag of waters intact? Or is she leaking? And then we want to do a sterile vaginal exam if it's appropriate. So before we do a sterile vaginal exam, we have to know a couple of things. Is she bleeding profusely? If she is, we're not going to do a sterile vaginal exam. We talked about that in antepartum. And the second thing is, where is her placenta located? Is her placenta in the correct place? away from the cervical opening, or does she have a placenta previa? If she has a previa, we're not going to do a sterile vaginal exam. So a couple of reasons we would not do sterile vaginal exams, profuse bleeding or placenta previa. Um, also, in some facilities, there is um, there are policies on how... Um, on what gestation you can do exams on moms, sterile vaginal exams. So for example, in some facilities, if the patient is less than 32 weeks pregnant, the nurse is not allowed to do that vaginal exam without a direct order from the physician. Um, but that changes from facility to facility, so you have to know the policy. 
And then we might do Leopold's maneuver because Leopold's maneuver can help us determine what position the baby is in. Is the baby um, head down? Is the baby anterior or posterior? And then we're going to draw lab work on mom. We're going to check her blood counts. And we are going to get a urine just like they do every time at the doctor's office. And we're going to send that down to the lab and have that tested as well. Hold on, guys. I'm plugging my computer in. Okay. Um, all right. So another thing to mention to you guys, which is brain. I talked about this in the last PowerPoint. It's an important so I'm going to say it again. If rupture of membranes occur or have occurred prior to the patient getting to the hospital, if they occur in front of you or before you see it happen, there are some things that you have to document as the nurse of this patient. We got to know what time that happened. When did her membranes rupture? When did she first notice it? And the reason is because this is a portal of infection now. If her membranes are ruptured, then um, we have a, an opening that infection um, can pass through or bacteria can pass through and cause an infection. So we're not going to allow this mom to have rupture of membranes, but for so long. And we're also going to want to make sure vital signs and monitoring her closely as well. Um, typically, physicians do not um, like to allow a mom's membranes to stay ruptured longer than 24 hours. Um, but that depends on the physician, it depends on the policy, and it depends on um, also what gestation the mom is as well. So. We got to note time. The other thing that we have to note is the fetal heart rate. If it happens in front of you, what is the fetal heart rate doing? And we have to document coca. So color, odor, consistency, and amount. We hope that amniotic fluid is nice and clear. Sometimes it can have little flecks of vernix in it, little bits of lanugo. Um, one thing we don't want to see in amniotic fluid is meconium because that tells us that at some point the baby has been stressed out enough that it's past its meconium. So remember those things. All right, so we not only have mom to assess, but we also have the fetus to assess. And there are a few ways that we do a fetal assessment. The very first thing that we, that we want to do is determine what the fetal heart rate pattern is. And remember, this is an interpretation by the nurse. We got to figure out what the baseline heart rate is. We want to know what the periodic changes of the heart rate are. So periodic changes include acceleration, decelerations and decelerations there are several types correct we have early d cells late d cells and variable d cells early d cells are indicative of head compression so if we have a mom who comes in this is her you know she's been in on the labor hall for 15 minutes so you've got her hooked up to a monitor she's having moderate to strong contractions whenever you palpate and you notice that the baby is having early D cells, then you can pretty much guarantee that that baby's head is far enough down in the birth canal that it's being compressed to cause those early D cells. That tells you as a labor nurse that this labor probably will not last too terribly long. You might want to get your stuff set up. Um, late D cells, 
those, those types of decelerations are indicative of uteroplacental insufficiency. We know that if we see late decelerations on a monitor, those decels that come after the contraction, we know the baby does not have adequate oxygen reserve to recover and is not doing very well inside. Variables are indicative of cord compression. And if we are seeing variables, then we need to do some intrauterine resuscitation, just like we would with the late deceleration, to um, get pressure off of that cord. So we may want to flip mom from one side to the other. She may um, need a little IV bolus. It just depends on your patient. I'm just trying to repeat these things so that you guys hear them over and over again and can remember them. Um, the fetal heart rate pattern is the most important tool that you have as the nurse to evaluate the fetal status. Um, another assessment that we do on the fetus is to determine positioning. And we can do that one of two ways. We can check the cervix, feeling for the fetus's presenting part, find our landmark, and determine where our landmark is in relationship to the mom's pelvis. So that's where we determine is the posterior fontanelle anterior or posterior, or is it left and is it left or right? So is the baby occiput anterior or occiput posterior? And remember for this class, we are only worried about um, babies that are in a cephalic position presenting vertex whenever we are gonna, whenever we're discussing um, position. Another way that we do a fetal assessment is determining presentation, right? Is a baby presenting phallic, head down, or do we have some type of malpresentation going on? Is the baby breech? Is the shoulder presenting? Um, those are important things to note. And the way we figure those out is by doing a sterile vaginal exam. Now, the other way that we could determine fetal position is through Leopold's maneuver, like we discussed in the last lecture. These pictures show you a few different things. Um, this picture on the top is a fetal scalp electrode. If you look really closely at the end of this little white tip, you can see sort of like a metal looking uh, thin little ring. That is a small little wire that actually screws into the baby's head. The picture below that on the left-hand side um, is what a fetal scalp electrode would look like put, um, put onto a baby. And this just helps us trace the baby's heart rate internally. And sometimes we have to use that if we are unable to trace the baby um, externally with a Doppler, or if the baby is in distress. And one thing to note about this fetal scalp electrode and its placement is that we do not um, place these unless the water is broken. You cannot place these through an amniotic sac and then screw it into the fetal head. The water has to be broken. The amniotic sac has to be ruptured for you to place this on the baby's head. Um, and also, if the mom is having any sort of infection, so if she's GBS positive, if she has HIV, um, those kinds of things, we would never use one of these on the baby if the mom was experiencing one of those types of complications. And the reason is because this does actually puncture the skin. So we would never want to screw this into a baby's head, allowing a portal for infection to get through. 
if the mom was GBS positive or HIV positive, et cetera. Another thing to mention here too is um, with fetal assessment, we can also check fetal scalp. Um, we can do fetal scalp blood sampling to help us determine oxygenation. And when we take a P, when we run a pH from the scalp of a fetus, 7.25 is normal. Anything less than 7.25 indicates to us that there's some type of hypoxia, and that requires an immediate intervention um, from the nurse and the team caring for her. So definitely something that your physician would need to know. All right, let's talk about nursing care during the different stages of labor. So with the first stage of labor in the latent phase, the assessment things that you might do as the nurse would be Leopold's maneuver, sterile vaginal exams, um, assessing for rupture of membranes, bladder palpation. The reason why we would want to do bladder palpation is because if the bladder is full of urine, it's not going to allow the baby to descend into the pelvis and engage appropriately. So we want to keep mom's bladder as empty as we can, either offering for her to void frequently, every couple of hours, um, placing a Foley if that is what your physician orders, although that's not evidence-based anymore. Um, or we may have to do an in and out cast if she's unable to void. Vital sign-wise, we want to check blood pressure, heart rate, and respirations every 30 minutes to an hour. And if her bag of waters are intact, we will get her temperature every four hours. But if they're ruptured, we're going to be taking her temp every one to two hours, depending on your hospital's policy. We want to check her contraction pattern every 30 to 60 minutes and her fetal heart rate pattern at the same time every 30 to 60 minutes. At this point, we're educating mom on the labor process. We're implementing and coaching her on relaxation techniques. We promote comfort and help relieve pain whenever possible. We assist her in positioning, encouraging upright positions because this will help the baby move down into the vaginal canal. We encourage and assist ambulation. Remember, when mom is um, in true labor, activity will worsen those contractions, which is a good thing if we want to progress a labor on down the road. So this is why you see moms up and walking around in the hospital, because we're trying to get those contractions stronger, closer together, and more intense. However, one time when we would not allow the mom to walk around is if her membranes are ruptured, and the presenting part of the fetus is not engaged in the pelvis. And I hope this makes sense to you because remember we talked about amniotic fluid being that cushion in utero for the baby and for the umbilical cord. If it, it provides all that buoyancy for the baby to float around in, okay? If the baby is floating around up high, the baby is not engaged in the pelvis, um, meaning the head isn't stuck down there, and her water breaks, now we have a loss of that fluid and that buoyancy that has been provided, and we allow this mom to get up and walk around, there is a huge risk that the umbilical cord will slip through and pass through, um, pass underneath the baby's head and through the vagina or through the cervix out into the vagina. That is not good. 
because you can't labor that way. Um, obviously, if the cord, that's called a cord prolapse, if that cord prolapses, um, there's no way for the baby to continue to descend into the pelvis because you're going to um, basically asphyxiate the baby. You're going to cut off blood supply because you're going to smash that cord. So that person would have to have a C-section. So we would never, ever allow a mom to walk around if the presenting part of the fetus is not engaged in the pelvis and her water is broken. Very important point for you to remember. Um, and you're already talking to her mom waited a couple of hours to keep the bladder empty. Um, I want to touch quickly on educating during the labor process and coaching on relaxation techniques. Um, remember, the first stage in the latent phase of labor is that stage where the mom is Facebooking, she's got her cell phone in the bed, she's texting all her friends because, um, you know, things are great. Life is good. She has this birth fantasy of how things are going to turn out. She's not hurting too bad yet, and she's thinking, hmm, this is not real bad. Um, so at this point, she's able to handle um, what's going on, and she is at a prime opportunity for learning at this point. Once she gets to the next phase, um, she's going to be hurting and she's going to be wanting pain medicine. So she's not going to want to listen to anything you have to say, educating her on the labor process or helping her um, figure out techniques to relax because she's not going to care about anything you're saying. So we want to try to educate these people at the right time. So in the latent phase is the right time to educate her about this labor process. She will listen to you more than likely and she'll learn something at this point. During the active phase of the first stage, much of the assessment things are very similar. We do sterile vaginal exams to check the progress of labor, cervical dilation and effacement. We assess for rupture of membranes, whether or not it's happened. We continue palpating the bladder and encouraging mom to void. We check vital signs every 30 minutes, blood pressure, heart rate, respiration. Same thing for temperature every four hours if um, the bag of waters is intact and every one to two if they're ruptured, depending on the policy of the hospital. But the contraction pattern and the fetal heart rate pattern change at this time. Remember, during the active phase, we're four to seven centimeters dilated. Our contractions are becoming more frequent. They're becoming longer in duration. They're becoming more intense. And so we want to know what that looks like from a contraction pattern standpoint. And we also want to know how is the baby responding to this increase in labor patterns. So we're going to assess contractions and fetal heart rate patterns every 15 to 30 minutes during the active phase of the first stage of labor. Intervention-wise, we're going to continue to provide monitoring to the mom and the baby. We can still educate on the labor process at this point, but mom's not going to listen to you quite as well at this um, phase of the first stage because she's really starting to hurt at this point. Things have intens intensified for her, and this is the phase of labor where mom's start to want pain medicine. Um, they want their epidurals. They um, want their narcotic um, IV meds, if that's what they're choosing. So it's going to be harder to educate her at this point. But like good nurses, we continue to try. Um, we might have to teach her about some breathing techniques at this point because she may be starting to um, you know, need that focus to get through her contractions. 
We want to promote comfort and relieve pain doing both non-pharmacological and pharmacological interventions. Non-pharmacal interventions would be things like frequent position changes, um, effleurage, breathing techniques, and if it's not contraindicated, so meaning, um, you know, you have an order from your physician and the fetal head is engaged, whether her water is broken or not, we can encourage ambulation. This will kind of help the process go a little quicker. Is it going to relieve her pain? Absolutely not. It's going to make it worse. Um, but that's what we hope for because we want to speed along labor. And here we get to the bad boy phase, transition. During transition, our assessment things are very much the same. The only changes that we really have are the vital sign changes and the contraction pattern and fetal heart rate pattern changes in, in terms of what times we assess those. So for blood pressure, pulse, and respiration, we're going to be checking these things every 15 to 30 minutes for a mom in the transition phase. Remember, this is the get it out of me stage. They are mad at the world because it hurts like crap and they are just ready to get it out. Um, where things have intensified greatly to the worst point in labor at this, at this phase. Um, so we're monitoring our contraction pattern every 10 to 15 minutes and our fetal heart rate pattern every 15 to 30 minutes. Um, now, with that said, most of the time during this phase of labor, moms are on a continuous monitoring, so we're monitoring them all the time anyway. Um, but if we were intermittently monitoring somebody, those would be your time frames. So for interventions, we continue to provide monitoring for both the mom and baby. We continue to encourage voiding every couple of hours. Remember, we're getting really close to stage two of labor, which is the pushing phase. And we want mom to have an empty bladder so that the baby can move down into the birth canal in the best way possible and as quickly as possible. We want to continue to educate on the labor process if we can, um, but mom's not going to be listening to you probably very much at all at this point. Um, but sometimes we do have to do some education here because, for example, the mom who has gotten IV pain medicine may be asking you for some more. But we can't give any more IV pain medicine during the transition phase because it tends to move pretty quickly and we don't want that IV pain medication to be circulating in the baby's system when it's born. So she may need some education on things like that. We want to encourage that pant pant blow breathing, um, but we don't want her to hyperventilate, so another thing that we might have to educate her on. We want to discourage her from pushing until she's fully dilated to 10 centimeters. Remember, if you start pushing prior to being uh, the cervix being fully dilated, then it's going to start to swell and cause cervical edema. We might cause cervical lacerations, which we can bleed from and cause hemorrhage. So we have to be very encouraging to mom, and we have to educate her that it's not good to push, even though she wants to and she has a lot of pressure and feels like she really needs to do that. We have to help her breathe through that urge during a contraction. Another thing really important for a labor nurse is to listen to your mom. If she tells you that the baby is coming, if she tells you that she's feeling pressure, you better check her cervix because she knows better than anybody what she feels. It's very important that we listen to her complaints. 
we at this point prepare for the birth. We set up our birthing table. We make sure our physician is aware that things are moving quickly and that she's in the transition stage. And we have to assess her perineal area as well. We're looking for bulging and we're looking for crowning of the presenting part. And whenever she moves from the transition phase into the second stage or the pushing phase of labor, then we encourage her to bear down with her contractions once she's 10 centimeters. Um, moms are very restless at this point and they want this baby out now. So it's worth mentioning again to you that she is going to want some pain medicine, especially if she does not have an epidural. Um, she's going to want something to make her feel better. And if she's getting that IV pain medicine, she cannot have it here because it will stay on board in the baby's circulatory system after the baby's born and cause respiratory depression for the, for the baby. Um, and that's not something that we want. So it's not safe for the fetus to be, able to be given pain medicine at this point to mom. All right, so now we've progressed and our mom is able to push. We are in the second stage of labor. We're going to be assessing a whole lot more frequently during this stage. You're right by the bedside. This patient is one-on-one. -on -one. You can't take care of anybody else. You have to be right there by her side. We're checking blood pressure, pulse, and respirations every 5 to 30 minutes, depending on your mom. Um, we're checking temp every 1 to 2 hours, because hopefully by this point, water is broken. We're, we're monitoring the contraction pattern continuously during this point because we're helping her push. And if we don't know what's happening with every contraction, we can't help her push effectively. We do not want mom pushing between contractions. We want her resting when her uterus is resting. When her uterus is working, we want her working. Um, we, we encourage her with each pushing effort and we assess her pushing effort. Is she able to move the baby down the birth canal when she pushes? So at this point, we are probably continually doing a sterile vaginal exam. We're probably sitting on the bed with mom um, with our hand in the vagina, checking the cervix, feeling for the presenting part, and determining how much she can move that baby down the birth canal with her pushing effort along with a contraction. Um, Sometimes it takes a while for, for moms to get the hang of it. Um, I have had patients before that we've pushed for upwards of two hours. So this, is a, this can last a while, and we want to be assessing how well she's able to push. Um, we're continually looking at that fetal heart rate pattern at least every 15 minutes. And then immediately, once the baby's born, obviously we want to know the heart rate. And we're assessing her perineal area for any types of lacerations. Um, there are different types of lacerations. We have first, second, third, and fourth degrees. Um, and just to sort of give you an idea of the range of those, a first degree laceration is just a small tear in the perineum. A fourth degree laceration is a tear that goes all the way from the vaginal opening completely through to the rectal opening. So that's a that's a bad boy. That's tore up from the floor up if you have a fourth degree. Um, intervention wise. We continue to monitor. We assist her in positioning for effective pushing. You can see this lady here in the picture. We have the knees pulled back as far as we can. We've got the pelvis open as much as possible. She's not in a supine position, but she's sort of in a like a low Fowler's um, 
we want her to be able to put her chin to her chest and kind of curl up around her belly so that she can push all of that effort down through her pelvis and help that baby move. We want to be co coaching those pushing efforts, but we want to promote rest between contractions. We want her to be able to catch her breath, to take a nice long relaxation, and if moms get too tired out, it's okay to let them rest through a contraction. Um, we may have to clean the perineum with betadine or sterile water or whatever your um, normal saline, whatever your physician requests. Um, sometimes moms will have a bowel movement during the pushing stage, and if that happens, we definitely want to be cleansing with betadine. Um, if the physician needs to cut an episiotomy, so this is where he actually takes a pair of scissors and cuts the perineum to make the opening for the vaginal opening a little larger for the baby to come through. We might have to assist with that by handing tools off the stair field um, or getting him things that he requests. Um, we want to provide mom feedback on her labor progress. So she doesn't know how far the baby is moving through her birth canal. She feels pressure, but we want to be able to, to tell her that she's close or you're almost there or that's it. You're doing a great job. I can see that the baby's coming down. You know, keep it up. We, she needs a lot of encouragement during this phase. When the baby starts to cram, it might help to actually hand her a mirror and let her look to see actually how far the baby does come down as she's pushing. Um, some women don't want to see nothing, and that's fine. But we have to prove encouragement because it's really hard work. Um, and then obviously being prepared with our equipment that we need during the delivery of the baby. Um, if the mom has an epidural, we have to really be cognizant of her ability to feel how to push prior to beginning her pushing stage. If she cannot feel um, the urge or she cannot, she doesn't have the sensation to be able to push effectively, we don't want to be wearing her out trying to get her to push if she's not doing a good job at it. So if she's got an epidural and that's the case for her, then we may have to turn that epidural off and sort of let some of it fade out of her system a little bit and then try to push with her again so she can be effective. Our main goal here is to have, obviously, a healthy outcome for mom, a healthy outcome for baby. And if we exhaust our mother during the second stage and we're, we're having her push whenever we know it's not effective, then all we're doing is exhausting the energy resources that she has. So we don't want her pushing if she obviously cannot do it. We want to give time for that epidural to wear off and then try again. During the third stage of labor, this is our um, time whenever the placenta delivers, okay, so from the birth of the baby to the delivery of the placenta. We are assessing blood pressure, pulse, and respirations every 15 minutes. We're getting a temperature every hour. We give the baby some APGARs because the baby's born by now and we've got to assign one and five minute APGARs to the baby. So now we really truly have got those two patients and we can see both of them. So now we're having to assess the fetus as well or the baby. Um, and we're looking for these signs of placental separation. You need to know these. You're going to be able to see the fundus rise up in the abdomen and it's going to be firm with a contraction. The uterus is going to be globular shaped. You're going to get a swift gush of dark blood or trickle from the vagina. And then the umbilical cord is going to further protrude out of the vaginal opening. Also, there's going to be vaginal fullness on exam because that placenta is coming out through there. Um, 
all of those signs are signs that the third stage or the delivery of the placenta is imminent. It's happening. And remember, if this stage of labor does not occur within 30 minutes, so we have a placenta, we have a baby that's born and a placenta that does not come out in a 30 minute time frame, then that placenta is considered retained and that mom is going to have to have some type of surgical intervention to remove that. And she's at a great risk for hemorrhage if that happens. So some interventions that we provide during this third stage, we provide monitoring for the mom. We give immediate newborn care. Remember your ABCs and we assign those one and five minute APGARs. We instruct her to push whenever we're seeing those signs of placental separation because it does help for the mom to give a little push to help the placenta come down and come out. Um, at this point, we start giving mom Pitocin. After the placenta is expelled, then we're going to start a Pitocin drip on mom. The reason that we do this is to help the uterus clamp down, stay contracted, keep that uterus nice and firm so that mom does not bleed, so there's no hemorrhage, hopefully. Um, we don't want to start Pitocin before the placenta delivers because what we don't want to happen is we don't want the uterus to clamp down and not let go of the placenta. So we always wait until after the placenta has been delivered to start that Pitocin drip. We may have to administer some analgesics to mom because she's going to be exhausted and sore. So she may need some Motrin or some type of, of medication. If she has an epidural, we will remove that catheter. We'll sit her up and we'll pull it out. Um, epidural catheters typically always have a blue tip on the end. So if we pull out an epidural catheter, you always note the blue tip on the end of that catheter so that we know we've gotten all of it and it was intact when it, whenever it was discontinued. The perineum is gonna be sore and swollen and very reddened at this point. So we may need to apply an ice pack um, clean things up for mom, get her a um, pad, and then we want to promote bonding with the newborn at this point. Hopefully the baby's skin to skin, and that's um, promoting bonding. But this is the very first opportunity that the mom has to bond with her baby, so we want to do everything we can to encourage that, if at all possible. And here is the fourth stage. Remember the fourth stage is our recovery stage. This lasts from one to four hours after um, the placenta is delivered. And during this stage, we check maternal vital signs. We do our bubble he assessment, our, our fundal assessment, our fundal rub. We check the lochia the color, the odor, the consistency, the amount. We check her urinary output and we assess how well is she bonding with her fetus. Um, some red flags for you would be if the fundus is boggy. If you go in during the recovery stage or the fourth stage of labor and you rub the mom's fundus and it's boggy, then that's a red flag that she's going to bleed out if we don't fix that. And the way that we fix that, our priority nursing and intervention, whenever a fundus is boggy, is to rub it. Rub it until you firm it up. Um, with lochia, a couple of red flags. If you have a steady trickle of blood, if you have huge gushes of blood, if you have lots of clots, that is something that really needs to be watched very, very closely. If your mom is saturating a pad from front to back 
in less than an hour's time um, or passing lots and lots of clots, that's a sign that something's not right, especially when it's accompanied with vital sign changes that line up with hypovolemic shock. Urinary output. If mom's urinary output is decreased, then we might need to think of a couple of different things. Number one, is she going into hypovolemic shock? Do we see any other signs of that? And number two, is she retaining urine because of the Pitocin that we're running? Remember, I said that Pitocin, one of the side effects of that is urinary retention and water intoxication. So we want to be sure that mom's not having any type of side effect related to that Pitocin in regards to her urinary output. So for interventions during this fourth stage, we do vital signs every 15 minutes for the first hour. And then per the facility protocol, um, usually what you find is vital signs every 15 minutes for the first hour, every 30 minutes for the second hour, and then every hour up to four hours of care. And at the same time we're doing these vital signs, we're, check, we're doing a fundal massage, checking lochia, we're monitoring the perineum. Um, it's important to note here that if mom has an episiotomy or a laceration, we want to be looking at that every single time. Hematomas, as you know, can form in any place where we've, well, any place in the skin, but it's more likely to occur in a place that um, has been cut open. For example, a surgical wound, like an episiotomy. Um, if we get a hematoma that forms in the perineum, it is possible for that hematoma to collect up to 500 milliliters of blood. So we really have to be assessing and looking good at the perineum whenever we're taking care of this mom in the fourth stage. Remember at what point we start to experience signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock at 500 milliliters loss of blood. And remember, we've got a mom who's already lost some blood. We want to provide comfort, warm blankets for the mom. A lot of the times mom gets, this, uh, mom gets the shivers or the labor shakes is what we call them after she's delivered a baby. And it's just a, it's just a response from her body that happens. It happens to some people and it doesn't happen to others. Um, but they may need a warm blanket to help with that. We administer the Pitocin or the oxytoxics, um, oxytocic meds. We encourage her to void because we don't want her retaining urine. We promote rest at this point because she is exhausted. We promote hydration with IV fluids and she can eat and drink at this point. And we get her some food because at this point moms are exhausted and they're hungry and they're thirsty. And then we make sure that she has plenty of opportunity to bond with the baby. All right, let's talk really quickly about some alterations during the intrapartum period. So, for the mom who comes in and her cervix it is not at a point to really lend itself very well to the laboring process. So, in other words, her cervix hasn't ripened up yet. It hasn't softened and it's not ready for labor. Then we can do a few things to help with cervical ripening. These are interventions that are done by the physician or the nurse. Cytotec is a medication that will ripen up the cervix. It's a little pill, comes in micrograms, and we insert um, a little pill of Cytotec into the vaginal canal up close to the cervix, 
and that will dissolve and it will cause the cervix to soften up and cause the uterus to start to contract. Um, Cervidil is very much the same as Cytotec. However, Cervidil can be removed. So Cervidil is a long string and it is like almost like a ribbon and it is soaked with medication. So whenever we insert this string into the vaginal canal, we put it up as close to the cervix as we can or even inside the cervix if we can get it there. And it does the exact same thing that Cytotec does. It helps the cervix start to ripen up and it will start the uterus contracting. The good thing with Cervidil is that it can be removed. We can take it out. With Cytotec, once that pill dissolves, it's gone. You can't get it back. So um, what we worry about with Cytotec is that if we overstimulate the uterus, meaning we cause contractions that are too close together and the uterus is not getting resting tone, we worry about uterine rupture and we worry about oxygenation to the baby if the contractions become too strong because we can't get that med back. With Cervidil, if that happens, we can just pull that string of medicine out and then it's gone. Um, also, there's something called a balloon catheter. And basically, this is just a Foley that's placed inside of the cervix. And then we blow the balloon up to help open up the cervix. Um, and that will help it ripen. If we're inducing labor, then... We can also use Pitocin, which all of you are familiar with, and we've talked about the side effects of those, which is urine retention and water intoxication. And um, we can also induce labor by rupturing membranes. And A-R-O-M stands for artificial rupture of membranes. That means the doctor did it. We artificially ruptured them. Sometimes... Um, the babies don't want to come out like they're supposed to. And when that's the case, they may need a little help from the doctor during that pushing phase, so that second stage of labor. And we can do that in a few ways. We can do, them with, do that with forceps. Um, forceps are these uh, little metal scoop-looking things and those are placed into the vaginal canal around either side of the baby's head. So there are two of them. They look like ice cream, like huge ice cream scoops, sort of. Um, they're placed around the baby's head, and the physician can pull the baby at the same time that a contraction happens and mom pushes. We don't like really to use forceps anymore because the risk of, of their use is um, pretty significant. So um, you don't see them used quite as often. But vacuum extraction is this kind of the same thing. There's a particular brand of vacuum extraction called a kiwi. And that's probably what you'll hear me call it is a kiwi because that's what I'm used to using. But this is just a little device. It's a little suction cup that you can place on the fetal head while it is in the vaginal canal and you pump up the end of it and it applies this suction cup to the baby's head and as the mom pushes and has a contraction, the physician can pull and help that baby move down the vaginal canal. An episiotomy is just where the physician cuts the perineum to allow the vaginal canal to extend a little more so the baby can come down and obviously a cesarean birth is when none of that stuff works well and we got to get the baby out another way we have to take her back for a c-section VBAC stands for vaginal birth after cesarean so this means the mom has had a c-section with her last pregnancy and now she wants to try a vaginal birth. And that's okay as long as she has not had more than one C-section or she does not have a classical incision. Those two things 
will lend her uterus to rupture um, and we don't allow them to do that because it's very unsafe. So I've got a few danger signs here worth mentioning. Um, with the mom, if you see abnormal vital signs, Think about hypovolemic shock vital signs or think about the mom with increasing blood pressures. Those things are not normal and those are danger signs that you should pay attention to as a labor nurse. Changes in level of consciousness, also a danger sign. If we have inappropriate um, I'm sorry, you guys. I don't even know what DIS means. I think that might be a mistake. Inappropriate contractions, okay? So contractions that are not um, that are not going like they're supposed to. They're not increasing in um, frequency, not increasing in duration, not increasing in intensity. Those could all be danger signs that labor's not progressing as it should. And also, on the flip side of that, if we have inappropriate contractions that are too much of, um, you know, they're too close together, they're lasting too long, they're too intense, they're too strong, and mom is not getting any resting tone between those contractions, that's also a danger sign. So we don't want to be on one from one extreme to the other. We want things to progress appropriately. A full bladder is another danger sign. A pathologic retraction ring is a, a ring of scar tissue. The best way I know to describe it is kind of a ring of scar tissue around the cervix. Um, and that can uh, be there because of um, cervical procedures that mom has had in the past. Um, so like if she's, you know, had to have some types of cancerous cells removed or that kind of thing, um, sometimes those things can cause a pathologic retraction ring. But the big thing with this is that it does not allow the cervix to dilate like it should. Um, an abnormal abdominal contour of mom. Now think about that. The uterus is nice. It has a nice symmetrical look to it. If all of a sudden your mom's abdomen has an abd abnormal contour and things don't look right, if you can see the baby floating around in the abdomen, that's a bad sign. That mom's uterus is probably ruptured, but you will have seen signs of that hopefully before you've noticed the abdomen. Um, for the baby, danger signs that we want to pay close attention to. An abnormal fetal heart rate. So decelerations, specifically late decelerations. That is key for uteroplacental insufficiency. Meconium stained fluid, so when the membranes rupture, if we see meconium in that amniotic fluid and the baby is in a vertex presentation, then where do you think the baby is going to breathe all that meconium whenever it comes out um, during delivery? Yes, it's going to suck that, all that meconium down into its lungs and we're going to have aspiration of meconium, so we have to pay close attention to babies who have meconium stained amniotic fluid. Also, babies that are hyperactive, ones that, um, you know, we looked at fetal heart rate patterns, those babies that have marked variability or tachycardia, those are not good signs. It means that something is not right. And then fetal acidosis, and this occurs when the baby is um, having hypoxic insults. 
so low oxygen levels that are causing this acidosis. Um, I'm just taking a look at how many more slides we've got. Okay, I think that we'll stop here for lecture um, one of Individual Module 5.2, PowerPoint 2. Whenever we continue with lecture two, we will begin talking about nursing care during labor and birth for moms who are receiving a cesarean section. Thanks for listening.